This is the Week in Sustainability from Workiva Carbon, formerly Sustain Life. It's where our team of experts and practitioners share weekly insights and commentary to keep you up to date about all things sustainability. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Week in Sustainability. Uh, my name is Mitch Voss. I'm a director here at Workiva Carbon on our client services team, and I'm joined by Hassam. Uh, Hassam, I'll pass it over to you for a quick introduction. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Uh, so my name is Hassan Mukadi. I'm a senior sustainability consultant here at Workiva Carbon, uh, where my primary focus is to assist clients uh, with their sustainability journey. So in today's topic, what we really want to dive into is uh, a recent report from CDP and was co-authored with CDP as well as BCG titled Scope 3 Upstream, Big Challenges, Simple Remedies. Uh, I think for sustainability professionals, there's a lot of really great both insights and things that I think a lot of people know already, but I think it, it was really something that highlighted a lot of the challenges that people are facing in the space and what are some practical solutions that can be put in place for both corporates as well as like investors to really drive action for uh, decarbonization and sustainability. Uh, so I'm yeah, curious to hear some of your insights and what some of the key topics uh, you want to cover today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you touched on it, right? Scope three is challenging, right? Particularly kind of, you know, quantifying your scope three emissions and acting on your scope three emissions. So kind of, you know, when you think about scope three, you know, that, that is your value chain emissions, like everything upstream and downstream of your operations. So the report highlights that companies are twice as likely to measure operational emissions compared to their supply chain or value chain emission. So kind of this lack of focus on scope three often results from a lack of immediate visibility and control over all of these upstream and downstream emissions. Uh, and sometimes actually a lack of perceived urgency, uh, which again, some of the regulatory uh, bodies, you know, such as SEC and CSRD coming into place, you know, to, to provide kind of that, you know, that, that driver to for companies to actually start reporting those scope three emissions and measuring and acting upon those scope three emissions. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the things that was, I don't think this will be a surprise to sustainability professionals out there, but it really emphasized that, you know, scope one and two emissions are getting the lion's share of attention right now. I think, you know, where a majority of organizations are at, it's, it's focusing on decarbonization, for example, through renewable energy or you know, purchasing of, of RECs, things like that. However, you know, the bulk of emissions, you know, thinking about scope three emissions, particularly upstream emissions are a majority of uh, most organizations emissions. One interesting fact too, is only 15% of companies are setting targets for scope three emissions. What do you think is really driving that gap between the focus on scope one and two versus scope three? Great question. So. You know, as you can imagine for scope three, it's, it's really the, 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 the lack of data for those value chain emissions, right? And that is one of the main things that we always talk about is like, how can you reach out to your suppliers to get the, that primary data to, to, to calculate your scope three emissions, right? And be able to actually set a target that you can act upon. So to me, it's not surprising at all to see that only 15% of companies do have a scope three target. Because again, a lot of the companies that do already measure their scope three emissions either rely on low quality data, such as like their spend based method, which again, as we know, every single company is expected to grow year over year. And with that spend is expected to grow. So if you're using a spend based method year over year, you won't be able to actually recognize any of the actions that your company is taking to reduce their scope three emissions. However, kind of moving into like that primary data and kind of trying to collect that supplier specific data, this is kind of where you can influence your suppliers to take action and therefore reducing your scope three emissions. So when you think about it from a, a leadership perspective, they tend to get more comfortable when they see kind of that solid plan with primary level data to set a target that is achievable for your organization. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's, it's only that I, I you know, I think sustainability professionals may be a bit tired of hearing <laughs> at this point that we don't have data. We don't know it's a data problem over and over again. And I want to get to some practical solutions, like even in those instances. And, and there's a couple of really great examples um, within in the report itself, too. But 
before that, I want to touch on one of the points that you mentioned around leadership. I think one thing that stuck out to me was the report really emphasizes like the role of governance in tackling particularly scope three emissions. Curious to hear your thoughts on, yeah, the importance that was highlighted around having like a climate responsible board. So when you, when you look at companies that do have board members or kind of a leadership buy-in for corporate sustainability efforts, uh, we tend to see that they take, you know, sustainability in a more holistic way. So it's not all just about measuring, but they also consider kind of the climate risks and what does that mean from a strategy and risk management perspective for the entire organization. So one of the things I'll point out from the report was that companies with such boards are significantly more likely to set and achieve an ambitious scope three target. So kind of this involves having at least one board member with expertise in climate issues and establishing that dedicated climate committee within that board structure. So such governance ensures that climate risks, risks and opportunities are integrated into the company's strategic planning and risk management process. Yeah, no, I think it was a really good point and one that certainly stuck out for me just in terms of um, various people that we engage with that companies that have that board structure or have that leadership, I won't say pressure, but more of like a, a buy-in and, and much more of a top-down approach. It, it was a thing that stuck out that, yeah, they do have a much more likely that they are much more likely to set more ambitious targets and to kind of drive that both engagement for getting scope three data and and actually, you know, going beyond just the calculations, but actually starting to reduce and set targets, but also, you know, having that cascade throughout the organization. I think uh, a lot of folks right now are, are feel the pressure can be in more of like a bottom up approach where, you know, sustainability teams are really owning some of this and having to maybe put pressure on, on leadership or, or board members to start to move the needle or start to, to drive that ambition. Uh, is one of the points I wanted to highlight before we get to actually some of the, the practical things that can be done, because I think it's a, it's a key point for, for those that are, are looking to uh, really drive this action within their organizations. One of the things I want to jump into next are some of the more practical things that can be done. I think one of the things that, that stuck out for me from the report was really around the need for strong supplier engagement. Can you, do you want to highlight some of the best practices that were highlighted or, or things that you've seen? Absolutely. I mean, we talk about supplier engagement every single day at this point with all of our clients, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, it is the cornerstone to collecting primary data where you can actually take action and reduce your scope three emissions. So one of the things that the report mentions is that companies actively engaging with suppliers on climate issues are actually 6.6 .6 times more likely to have a comprehensive 1.5 degree Celsius aligned transition plan, which is like the 1.5 degree Celsius is a science aligned or science-based aligned target. So what are some of the best practices? It includes kind of setting clear expectations for your suppliers, right? Providing resources, providing support, any documentation that can help them to measure and reduce their scope one, two, three emissions, which ultimately, you know, goes into or drives your scope one or your scope three uh, emissions in this case. Uh, so another thing uh, that we also always advise clients to do is like to in integrate climate related criteria into the procurement process. So all the way from the beginning, from that procurement stages, right? Have those, have those embedded into like your policies or your supplier code of conduct. Uh, those are critical to ensuring the success of your supplier engagement program. Um, so how would you do this? So how would you kind of incentivize, I guess, some of these suppliers to do some of this work? Again, this is a, a lot of work for your suppliers and you know, action. Uh, so this could involve incentives for suppliers to meet certain climate targets or collaboration on developing lower carbon products and services. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that, you know, that supplier engagement is key for decarbonization that, and, and, you know, it's something that isn't, I think, news to a, a lot of people in the space, but thinking about and even just starting and finding ways to engage with suppliers in a meaningful way is, is super important. And, you know, that can be something as simple as, as, you know, starting to see if they have calculated their scope one and two emissions. And, and if they haven't, really enabling them to do that. And then there's plenty of resources out there that can help them and 
key to that kind of carrot approach is what I'll call it. I think everyone thinks back to, you know, the carrot versus stick approach. That carrot or that collaborative approach is, is giving them the tools to be successful and really making sure that they feel supported or see value from doing those, even just scope one and two to provide that data to you, to start to have a real conversation around what can be done for decarbonization. One of the things too, that, that stuck out to me was the, the highlight of internal carbon pricing or ICP. Curious to hear your thoughts on how this tool helps company align their strategies to climate goals. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about internal carbon pricing, I would say, again, it's, it's not as commonly used throughout organizations. However, it is a powerful tool for embedding climate considerations into financial decision-making. So again, the, the report highlights that companies with an ICP are actually over four times more likely to have, again, a 1.5 degree Celsius aligned transition plan. And the idea of an ICP is to assign a cost to carbon emissions that happen throughout your operations. So essentially ICP helps companies account for the financial impact of their own carbon footprint and own the emissions that are coming out of their uh, operations and taking action because of that financial impact on their business. So why is that critical? Because it makes it an integral part of business planning and investment decisions. So it encourages more sustainable choices, such as investing in energy efficiency uh, in their buildings or their vehicles or like their fleet and kind of across their value chain or also kind of encouraging existing suppliers or selecting new suppliers with lower carbon footprints. Again, all to make sure that the financial impact is not as critical as if they, if, if they had like massive emissions across their value chain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think something that I personally, I'm a fan of, of putting that internal an ICP or internal carbon price in place. A really great example I've seen and there's a couple, well, a couple companies that I know are doing something similar to this, where they'll set the, the internal price of carbon. And then from there, they'll basically say for something like business travel, that here is the, the cost or here's what the, the carbon price is per metric ton of CO2B. And any savings that can be made, for example, from instead of taking a flight somewhere, you take a train, any of those savings get put into a fund that can be used for sustainability efforts. I think that kind of mechanism or that kind of way is, is a great way to start to move capital towards or, or start to fund projects in your organization to really drive decarbonization and, and move the needle in that way. Uh, one of the other things that was highlighted um, within the report was the, the focus on investors and basically the role that investors play. What do you think investors, their responsibilities are in this context? Yeah, absolutely. So similar to how an organization supplier engagement is critical, investors play a huge role in driving transparency and accountability, right? So, you know, investors are currently not adequately pricing in the risks associated with scope three emissions. So if you kind of look at the, 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 like the, the financial landscape, right? The investing landscape, only a small fraction of investors require or, you know, mandate disclosure of these emissions in the like scope one, two, three emissions or from their investees, which leaves a significant amount of risk that is unaccounted for. So think about all the, you know, the climate risks and, and, and on other cases, also the opportunities that are unaccounted for with those investments. So kind of one thing that the report advocates for is investors that demand comprehensive scope three disclosures and to actually integrate climate risks into their investment evaluations. So this can be done using tools like climate adjusted capital asset pricing model or CAPM for short, which adds a climate risk premium to the cost of equity that's going into that company or investee. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I really like that kind of model or approach, both from a risk side from, from the investor, but also for really driving action a, across, you know, a portfolio or across large number of organizations by having something like that in place and being transparent about it and letting uh, folks know like, this is the action that we're taking and, and the evaluations that we're making. I think, you know, it's pretty clear from the report or, or kind of the call to action is that both companies and investors need to step up. I, we talked on or we touched on some of the immediate actions or immediate, immediate priorities for action across both investors and companies. 
you mind just summarizing those for us or putting a, a fine point on what those are? Absolutely. Yeah. So the three points would be kind of, you know, strengthening your governance structure, right? Or your board oversight. So having the appropriate board member or board structure with the appropriate climate expertise to actually address some of these climate issues and integrate that into and make sure that this is all integrated into your governance structure and strategy, overall strategy of the business. The second point would be enhancing your supplier engagement. So again, for companies developing a robust engagement program to set and achieve your scope three targets in collaboration with your suppliers. Again, it's critical that your suppliers be on board with this. And the, the only way that you can incentivize this is providing them with the resources and kind of enabling them through those resources to actually provide you that information and act upon that information that they provide. And then the final one would be, again, implementing an internal carbon pricing. Uh, as you can imagine, embedding an ICP in decision-making process uh, allows you to actually align the business strategies with your climate goals in this case. Here's to here. Yeah, I think that was more focused on the, the company side of things. What were your thoughts on about investors in particular? Like, uh, I know we touched on a couple of things, but yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on some of the, the key points or, or what investors can do for, or what are some of the main priorities for investors in terms of immediate action? Yeah. So on the invest, investor side, one of the main things is, you know, we always say investors drive, you know, equity and can drive a lot of change at, at a company. So demanding that comprehensive scope one, two, three disclosure is critical. So ensuring that companies report a full scope three emissions data provides a clearer picture of the climate related risks and opportunities associated with that investee. And then the, the second point would, to, would be to integrate climate risk in, in valuations, right? So we mentioned the using the CAPM and other tools to actually properly account for climate risks in investment decisions, which can drive that risk like corporate transparency and action in this case. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for breaking those down. I think, you know, these are very complex issues and I appreciate you sharing your findings or your key findings from the report. Thank you, Mitch. And yeah, it's been, it's been a pleasure being here. I hope this information was actually helpful for companies and investors to actually take some more meaningful action uh, with scope three emissions. Perfect. That'll wrap it up for this week. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you in the next one. Workiva Carbon provides organizations with an easy-to-use solution to manage the full life cycle of measuring, managing, and reporting carbon emission. Now integrated into the same platform used to manage the world's most trusted financial and non-financial reporting. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this show on our YouTube channel or your favorite podcast platform. See you next week.